Hey guys, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Uh, today, I thought it would be a, a sort of a good idea to kind of talk about the cardiac cycle, and you know, this is one of those things we talk about Stallings Law and and afterload and preload and things like that, and. It's important to note, you know, how this affects the heart and how it can affect blood pressure um, and, of course, your patient. So it's sometimes it's a good idea just to kind of refresh on this, uh, I guess, the technical end of what goes on. So let's just real quick go over it, guys. Um, you know, I just want to kind of sort of give you this quick refresher. So I'm hoping this little chunk here will help you uh, really grasp this part of uh, cardiology okay um so what it is right it's the process it's going to create that pumping of the heart okay and it's known as that cardiac cycle and once it begins that myocardial contraction and it concludes at the beginning of the next contraction so the heart contraction results in the pressure changes within the cardiac chambers which then results in that movement of the blood from areas of high pressure to the area of low pressure so we talk about uh, systole this is what we talk about when we talk about contraction of the ventricle the ventricular mass let's say and the pumping of blood into the uh, into the body right the systemic and the pulmonary part of the body now during systole, the pressure is created within the arteries that can be recorded, and that's known as what the systolic blood pressure, right? That's what we hear when we take our blood pressure. So a normal systolic blood pressure, depending upon what book you read, uh, in an adult can be anywhere between 110 and, and 140, right? So there's also the other pressure, which is that relaxation phase or or diastole, right? The, the, the diastolic number. So that normal range, okay, again, depending upon what book you read and, and what you're going by, is usually between 70 and 90. So it's important to note about the, pl the pulse pressure, and when we look at patients and we try to evaluate patients, is knowing what the pulse pressure is. And the pulse pressure is that, that um, difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressures, right? So you get a patient that's, you know, 200 over 120, you got to start thinking that something is, is going on there, right? So you have to sort of think of the differences between, you know, the, the two and, and when how far away they are from each other, how close they are to each other, to sort of let you know the sort of pressures that are going on uh, inside the patient's heart and, of course, other things like their signs and symptoms, right? So now... The blood pressure, we note it as what, right? It's weird because it's noted as a fraction, right? It's always 140 over 70, 120 over 80, right? So we kind of show it as a fraction, right? And then we, we, when we talk about it and we, when we verbalize it, the MMHG in the blood pressure is known as millimeters of mercury, okay? Um, and really, technically, this is the, the height in millimeters uh, in which the blood pressure elevates in one column of liquid mercury. It's, it's all confusing stuff that you don't really need to know about as far as, you know, this is, we talk about that millimeter of mercury back when we used to take blood pressures and you ever see them sometimes still in doctor's offices when they take your blood pressure and you see the mercury getting pumped up, right, in that little vial. But for us, a lot of times we're using either, you know, manual blood pressure with the dial or we'll be using blood pressure that, you know, automatic BP cuffs where we get a digital readout. We might not necessarily see that whole heightening of that liquid mercury in that glass too that we we might see, you know, years ago or, or even some doctor's offices nowadays. Okay, so, but although a lot of blood pressure, again, no matter how many we use it nowadays, it's still described as the MMHG, that millimeters of mercury. Okay, um, just a good little tip there to remember that because that's the type of thing you might see on exams is what the MMHG stands for. Okay, now pressure in the aorta, which is the left ventricle, has to pump blood. All right, this is what we call the afterload. Okay, so the greater the afterload, the harder it's going to be for the ventricle to eject that blood into the aorta and this is what we what happens is that's going to reduce the stroke value okay so 
uh, all the way, you know, the, the amount of blood that's injected per per contraction. All right, so to to a large part, the afterload is really sort of controlled by the arterial blood pressure, and afterload is greater with vasoconstriction, and it's less when you've got vasodilation. Okay. So what about cardiac output? Well, this is actually the amount of blood that gets pumped through the circulatory system in a minute. So the, the, the cardiac output is expressed uh, usually in, in liters per minute. And what it is is the cardiac output ends up equaling the heart rate, which is multiplied, multiplied by the stroke volume. So you can say cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Okay, now some factors that can actually influence the heart rate, or the stroke volume, or, or both of them, um, will affect the, the cardiac output, will, will affect that heart rate, will affect that, that um, stroke volume, right? So, and that's going to end up, you know, things like oxygen delivery, right? It's going to, um, you know, give that perfusion issues okay to the tissues okay so there are things that can that can influence that and influ or influence either heart rate or stroke volume that's going to end up affecting the cardiac output and then of course sox delivery you know out to the body so think about a mechanical piston in the pump and stroke volume let's say is that fixed quantity right it's it's, it's fixed um and it's related to the distance that is traveled by that piston. Now, just stay with me for a second. But the heart, okay, in contrast, has a lot of different ways that it can increase the stroke value. So, one way is um, uh, it can, you know, the cardiac muscle actually is, is something where when it gets stretched out, right, it contracts with a lot greater force. Like a rubber band, the more you stretch that rubber band and you let go, it's going to be a bit big, bigger recoil, right? So same thing with the heart muscle. The, the bigger it, it stretches, the more of a recoil it's going to have, right? It's going to contract with a lot greater force. And I'm sure you've heard of this in school. If you haven't yet, and maybe you're in primary school right now, um, but this is something that has been called, you know, Frank Stalling mechanism or more popularly, the Stalling's law, right? And this is, of course, Frank Starling, and he's the guy that first sort of described this, that sort of realized that this was what was happening, okay? Now, if for some reason that um, increased volume of blood is returned from the systemic veins to the right heart or from the pulmonary veins to the left chambers, okay, um, that muscle is going to have to stretch to accommodate that larger volume, and the more cardiac muscles is going to stretch the greater the force of the contraction and the more completely it's 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 going to empty and then of course the greater that stroke volume okay if this is a little confusing to you guys go ahead and google Stalling's law and you know you'll see it kind of described several different ways um, I'm trying to do the best I can here. I mean, it, it's, it can be a little tricky, but just think of it sort of as um, that length of fibers, right, that's in the heart muscle, okay, and this is determining the force of the heartbeat, and, you know, that increase in, in filling, that stretching, right, is going to increase that force of the contraction. Again, think of it like being a rubber band. The further that you stretch it, the greater strength of the recoil. That's sort of simplifying it a little bit. But again, if you really want to delve into this a little bit more and really grasp it a little bit better, go ahead and Google Frank Stalling or St Mechanism or Stalling's Law, and you can probably get a, a, a even a bigger idea of what I'm talking about. Now, the one thing I want to I want to mention is something called ejection and f ejection fraction and preload. Okay, so what the amount of blood that returns to the right atrium okay it can vary from minute to minute right but the normal heart continues to pump out the same percentage of blood that gets returned and this is when we're talking about that ejection fraction okay so the, the, the even though the 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 um the the amount of blood might vary a little bit from minute to minute the same percentage is, is going to be getting you know, pump back out to uh, the body, 
Okay, and it's still it's going to be that's the stuff that's going to keep getting pumped out to the body and giving you that ejection fraction. Now, a little bit ago, we talked about the whole cardiac output, okay, and how that's the stroke volume times the heart rate. Okay, so if you think about it, any increase in stroke volume with the heart rate that that remains the same is going to increase the overall cardiac output. Okay, so I'll say it again. Any increase in stroke volume with the heart rate that's going to remain the same, it's held constant, is going to cause an increase in overall cardiac output. And now the pressure under where a ventricle fills is what we call that preload. Okay, and this is end up is influenced actually by the volume of blood that gets returned um, by the veins to the heart. So Think about how in situations of increased oxygen demand, right, the body returns more blood to the heart, right? So your preload is increasing, all right? And then your cardiac output is going to, of course, then in turn increase through the stalling law that we just talked about. Okay, I hope that makes sense, guys. You know, um, think about diseased heart. You know, it's the same mechanism gets used to achieve that whole normal resting cardiac output in a diseased heart, right? And this is why sometimes you get those disease hearts that end up being um, enlarged, right? Because it's that constant stretching, constant stretching, right? So think about that. I'm going to read that again just so maybe we can kind of understand the whole preload and how it reflects, you know, relates to Stalling's law, right? The pressure under which the ventricle is going to be um, filled, right, is called that preload. All right, now this, again, it's influenced by the volume of blood getting returned to the vein from the heart. Okay, or to the heart, I'm sorry, to the heart. Now, would you get that increased oxygen demand, you know, the person's having chest pain, um, difficulty breathing, things like that, the body is going to return more blood to the heart, and then that preload, okay, that pressure is going to increase, and then that cardiac output is going to increase, okay? And again, this is all part of that whole Frank Stone mechanism. So guys, listen, I hope this makes sense to you. I hope maybe this breaks it down a little bit. This is a very small part of the heart, how it works, cardiology, all that good stuff, right? Anatomy, physiology, and everything. Um, I hope you can maybe take away a certain little part of this or maybe the entire quick Monday minutes here and sort of uh, help you understand a little bit more when when we talk about stroke volume and heart rate and cardiac output and all that. Um, go ahead and take a listen again to this episode. Maybe really, uh, you know, hit home some of the key points maybe you're struggling with. Um, if you have some comments of your own or maybe even a better way to explain uh, Frank Stallings' law there, Go ahead and put it in the notes. I'd love to hear your take on it and how you would describe uh, Stalling's Law, okay? Again, this is something that you hear a lot in school, and a lot of times we sort of glaze over it, right? Um, and we kind of remember it for an exam. But it's important to remember what we talk about and what it all means and how it applies to the patient's, um, you know, well-being, their blood pressure, and what we can expect to see when something like that is is, uh, is taking place, right? So I hope you can use it again, guys. Uh, any Monday Minutes of your own, you have some questions, comments, or something you want me to go ahead and cover on a Monday Minute, send them over to me. My email is jhoffman at ems-safety.com. And until next week, as always, guys, Jim Hoffman, EMS Office Hours. Stay safe.